Hello and welcome to this special edition of Inside the Americas. I'm Nadia Massey. Call it pot, marijuana, skunk or grass, the way we smoke cannabis is changing. Once confined to hazy images of student dorm rooms, marijuana consumption is increasingly out in the open. From complete legalization in Uruguay to the steady increase of medical and recreational cannabis available in the United States. In this week's show, we take a close look at the progress and the problems of the legal high. Well, we begin then in Uruguay. It's been a year since it became the first country in the world to completely legalize marijuana all the way from production to sale. 12 months later, what impact is the regulation having on ordinary cannabis users? And is the once flourishing black market dying out? Robert Sutton Maddox has the story. A grinding noise familiar to cannabis users. But Ismail didn't need to go to a dealer to get it. Instead, he went to a pharmacy. He's registered on an official list and can buy up to 10 grams each week. Within a year, the number registered has gone up fivefold, from 5,000 to 25,000. The quality is good. It's strong enough to have an effect, but allows me to live a normal life. It's not the stuff that makes you crazy. Like many, Enrique was skeptical at first of selling this new product. Concerned for his reputation, how much money he could make, and also of it making him a target of robbery. Today, though, he is delighted. Cannabis has turned around the profits of his small pharmacy. For us, this is like selling medicine or an aspirin. We don't view it as selling marijuana. We treat it like any other pharmacy product. As yet, no agreement has been made with the big pharmacy chains. So far, only 14 shops take part, not enough to satisfy the demand. So many cannabis users resort to other methods, like growing their own or joining cannabis clubs. The only other legal ways of accessing recreational cannabis. Federico feels he gets better quality growing his own. After the process of the flowering, drying and collecting, flaws appear. Flaws in how it was dried, how the material was treated, so that it deteriorates by the time it reaches the pharmacy. The sale of cannabis in pharmacies is closely monitored, so much so that some buyers feel they are under surveillance by the state. Many still prefer the illegal black market. According to Uruguay's Cannabis Control Institute, Legally sold cannabis doesn't even make up 50% of the consumption. Well, to discuss the changes in Uruguay and elsewhere in the Americas in a little more detail, we are joined now by John Walsh, the Director of Drug Policy and the Andes for the research organisation WOLA. Uh, thanks very much for talking to us uh, on the programme today, uh, Mr Walsh. Uh, we heard then at the end of that report uh, that most of the cannabis uh, still bought in Uruguay is on the black market. Does that tell us then that the legalization hasn't worked as well uh, as lawmakers intended? Or, or do you think, by and large, it's been a success? I think, by and large, it's been a success, but it is clearly a work in progress. Legalization is not an event. It is a, it is a process. I think in Uruguay, they're making uh, inroads in the illegal market. To say that it's a, they have about 50 percent capture in the legal market, is good progress, but they clearly still have a long way to go. Uh, what about one of the other uh, key aims of this legislation, which was to try and reduce uh, drug trafficking? Has the legalization helped to decrease some of the violence that's been associated with the drug trade in South America? I think that's a harder question to answer, and it's a, it's a, it's a different kind of goal. Clearly, if you're going to deprive drug trafficking organizations of important revenues, which taking at least at this point 50% of the marijuana industry out of their hands is going to take some of their power away. But seeing how it matches on uh, actual rates of violence, I think, is a trickier question, and it'll take more time to tell. There's a lot of ways that drug trafficking can lead to violence. And one obvious one is if you have fewer illicit sales, there's going to be fewer opportunities for robbery and violence in that way. So I think the arguments are good for how it might happen, but it's harder to see and harder to, to, to document that. Uh, the market then, as we saw in that report, is pretty strictly regulated uh, in Uruguay. Some users say it's regulated too much, 
But the sale of mar marijuana through pharmacies allows for state surveillance uh, of consumers. Should they be worried? Are they being watched? I, I don't think they need to be worried that they're being watched, but I understand the concern. And on the one hand, the state, the government, when they created this law, they were intentionally very strictly controlled to reassure the neighbors and the sort of global community that this was not going to be a free-for-all um, and that they were going to be watching their borders and making sure that it didn't get out of hand. I think they've done a good job on that. It may need, they may need to loosen up over time. But one of the measures they took was to make sure that they can track uh, sales at the pharmacy. People just use their fingerprint. So it's an anonymous uh, form of IDing that's not attached to their name or their face, but it allows them to track how much is being bought and therefore whether people are staying within their quotas in the pharmacy system. It is complicated um, and it was an important part of the debate. I think over time, people are going to become more and more comfortable with the idea, especially as one government gives way to another and the, and the data is not abused. Uh, let's move on then uh, to uh, the United States. There's a bit of a more complex picture there than in uh, Uruguay. Several states having uh, legalized uh, marijuana and most Americans we now know do believe it's relatively safe to use. Is it time now for the United States to fully legalize cannabis use? Uh, I definitely think that it is. Uh, as you say, it's more complicated. Right now, we have nine states in the District of Columbia, the nation's capital, that have voted or, or through their legislature, legalized and regulated cannabis. Uh, but the federal government is lagging way behind. I think at the very least, the federal government should be taking steps to make sure that those states that have opted to legalize can do so without running afoul of federal prohibition and federal law and all sorts of um, reasons in, in terms of banking and access to uh, finance and ensuring that their legal markets aren't going to be upended by uh, federal enforcement that strikes away the regulatory structure that the states are putting in place. So it is complicated. I do feel that, as you mentioned, the, the trend line in terms of public support is clearly in the direction of legalization, and I think eventually the politicians are going to get that message. There are concerns, though, about legalization as well, uh, aren't there? Like, if we compare it to the dr to the tobacco industry, for example, or to the alcohol industry, you can argue that what you end up with is a highly commercial, profit-making industry that thrives off people's addiction. Isn't there a concern that if you legalize marijuana in the United States, you end up with more addicts? I think it is a concern, uh, and I think it's something that in the United States in particular, given the sort of commercial for-profit zeitgeist of the way that legalization is happening, it's a special concern. I think both the states, and, and in this case, I think it's especially important, and another reason why the federal government needs to involve itself more firmly, is to make sure that the legal regulated product doesn't just give way to private interest maximizing profit and therefore addiction, um, but has a public health at its center. So I think this is an opportunity, and you mentioned tobacco and alcohol. I think this is an opportunity in the case of cannabis, a different psychoactive, to do it right. Um, I think the signs are mixed at this point, but I think it's another important reason why the federal government needs to involve itself in a proactive and thoughtful way, rather than let states go all their own ways, some which may not be very um, healthy overall. Yeah, you mentioned there briefly uh, the role of the federal government. Are there incentives then for the state overall uh, to legalize cannabis in terms of, for example, uh, tax uh, revenue that they could gain? I mean, in the United States, that is one of the, the, the arguments in favor of regulating cannabis. Why leave it in the hands of criminal enterprise that pays obviously no taxes and doesn't care about youth use? but rather bring it under uh, regulatory control, put it in the hands of legitimate enterprise um, and benefit from the tax proceeds as well as from the legal jobs that are created. I think that is one of the big arguments, especially at the state level where budgets um, need to be balanced basically every year. It's not as powerful at the federal level, but you can imagine a, a, a very large multi-billion dollar industry developing and that those tax revenues are going to be important at different levels of government. So that is part of the question. I think making sure that the, the 
profit motives are also balanced against protections for the public health. John Walsh, we're going to have to leave it there, but thank you uh, very much for your time. John Walsh there, the Director of Drug Policy in the Andes at the research organization Walla, talking to us there from Washington, D.C. Well, as we've been hearing then, marijuana use is becoming more common in the United States, including among elderly communities. Here's the story of senior citizens getting their legal highs in California. Sat in front of her television, this 87-year-old is smoking marijuana. Brenna's evening routine now includes a few puffs on an electronic cigarette to help with her insomnia and a massage with cannabis oil to ease her rheumatism. The pain was so heavy, so I decided to, you know, give it a real try. And uh, after a few months, I was able to throw out the Vicodin. And I found that if I took a hit on the vape at night, it made me sleep longer. This Californian grandma is part of a surging new wave of seniors turning to cannabis. She has even become the face of an advertising campaign to educate the elderly about the use of CBD, the therapeutic chemical in cannabis seen as a natural alternative to drugs. CBD has been in the news a lot here, um, the non-psychoactive part of cannabis, because the seniors want to use cannabis. They've heard about all of its health benefits, but they don't want to get high. Seniors arrive by the busload at this dispensary, straight from their retirement home. Following an information session, and that's when you're actually putting the cannabis drops into your mouth. They hit the boutique in search of chocolates, ointments, and sprays. For now, only 3% of Americans over the age of 65 are regular users. Many older people are terrified of drugs. They don't mind medications which usually are really bad for you, but uh, cannabis frightens them. It's just a miracle plant. I can't say enough good about it. Though there are still very few elderly cannabis users, there are 20 times more than there were 30 years ago, a statistic that has not gone unnoticed by industry professionals, who expect seniors to pour tens of millions of dollars into the market by 2020. That report then from Laguna Hills in California brings us to the end of this special edition of Inside the Americas. Tune in next week then for all the news from north to south. Thanks for watching. France in Focus, presented by Tom Burgess Watson. The must-see program to understand France, its history and culture. An original look at French society and topical themes, revealing just what makes France and the French so unique. France in Focus, on France 24 and France24.com.